faults are amongst the most important dramatic structures in the earth. In this presentation, we're going to be looking at some terminology, describe the basic types of faults, and then how we can make some measurements on faults themselves. So let's imagine coming against an outcrop such as this one here in New Zealand, where we can begin to interpret a fault, and we can see that there may be a fault in the outcrop because the two black horizons have been offset. So how are we going to describe these features? So here's a simple cartoon. The rocks above the fault are called the hanging wall. The rocks below the fault are called the foot wall. And by recognising the offset of a marker between foot wall and hanging wall, we can measure the displacement, the amount of movement measured along the fault plane. So let's go back to New Zealand. There's the hanging wall and foot wall, and there's the displacement of the top of the upper dark horizon measured along the fault plane. This is a useful measurement, but often it's difficult to make directly. So we use proxies. One proxy is heave, which is the horizontal component. The other proxy is throw, which is the vertical component. Notice that to establish the heave, we have to know the extent of the horizon that's been offset, in this case the top of the green. So we have to be able to snap it to the fault to know exactly where it abuts the fault plane. So we need to know where the fault is. That's not the case for the throw. Let's go and have a look at how this plays out. So here's a seismic profile, and actually it shows a real-world problem. that the, We know there may be a fault in the section because of, we can infer offsets, but we don't know precisely where the fault is, so there's an uncertainty. The precision of the fault trace is difficult to determine, but we still want to be able to establish how much displacement there is on the fault. And for this we can use the throw. So. Let's try and look at this on the seismic. We can correlate a reflector, stratal reflector, across the fault and measure the difference in its position between hanging wall and foot wall when measured in the vertical sense. So the throw can be used to establish something about the fault displacement. OK, now let's think about faults in three dimensions. We've been linking in 2D so far. Let's move to three dimensions. So here's our fault. And we strip away the hanging wall and we can see that the fault is a surface, it's a planar surface in 3D space. So let's assume, and we'll make this assumption in the following diagrams, that the rocks were layered horizontal before faulting. And in this case we've just moved the hanging wall up and we term these faults where the hanging wall is moved up, thrusts. Let's see what the relationship of the stratigraphy is now across the fault plane. And we can do this using a vertical borehole cut down through the strata. And we can see that the stratigraphy is repeated in the borehole. The yellow unit appears twice. Older rocks are placed on top of younger. And this is a feature of thrust faults. Let's go to the alternative situation. And this time we're going to move our hanging wall down. We're still going to move it down the dip of the fault plane. So here's our fault plane, put the hanging wall back on and move it. Let's move down the dip of the fault plane and this time the hanging wall's down, we call these normal faults. So let's look in our imaginary borehole and in this time we cut out the yellow horizon where the borehole is against the fault so we've omitted stratigraphy. Younger rocks, green rocks are put directly against the pink, the older rocks. So we've got a classification of these dip-slip faults where the movement is up and down the dip direction of the fault plane. If the hanging wall moves up, it's a thrust fault. If it moves down, it's a normal fault. And they make specific uh, new arrangements to the stratigraphy as seen in boreholes. But of course, faults don't have to move up and down the dip direction. Let's see what happens when they move sideways along the strike of the fault. If we do that and look at our imaginary borehole, in this time the stratigraphy has not been offset. It's been moved sideways, but the, same, the stratigraphic order is the same. So how do we classify these strike slip systems? We do this in relative sense of movement. We can see here that in, this, in these two cases, the right-hand blocks have moved. One's moved away from us, the other one's moved towards us. 
So we look down on the fault plane, we can see half arrows giving us our sense of movement. Where the left hand side of the fault has moved towards us, we call those left lateral or sinistral faults. In the counter case, where the right hand side has moved towards us, we call these right lateral or dextral. Okay. So let's look at this, some key measurements we make on fault planes. If you look on a fault plane, it will commonly be striated with mechanical abrasions that are portraying the uh, axis of movement along the fault, whether it's dip, slip or stride slip. So let's look at this measurement. Start off with the fault plane itself. The fault is a plane, so therefore is measured with a strike and dip, the strike being the orientation relative to north of a horizontal line on that plane. And the dip is simply the inclination measured in its maximum direction, and it will have a a value somewhere between 0 and 90, in this case 65 degrees. Let's add some mechanical abrasions to it. So here are the striations on the fault plane which are telling us whether the fault is uh, slipping up or down dip or side to side. Well in this case it's slipping obliquely. How do we record that information? We do that with a feature called the pitch which is the angle made between the striation and the strike of the plane. So in this case here, it's simply 50 degrees. But notice we've also had to record which end of the strike bar we've made the measurement from. In this case, we've measured from the 200 bearing, which is south-southwest. So the pitch of the striation on this fault plane is 50 south-southwest. We do that because there's an ambiguity if we don't record that direction. There's a 50 degree orientation measured from O to O, which is not the orientation of the striations. So always record the end of the strike bar that you've made the measurement from. So the pitch of striations on fault planes allow us to determine whether we're dealing with a strike slip, an oblique slip, or a dip slip. Or dip slips up and down the dip direction, plus or minus a few degrees. Similarly, strike slip along the strike direction of the fault, and oblique slip somewhere in between. So let's try this out on an outcrop of a fault plane. We're looking onto the fault surface. We can see striations running from top right to bottom left, giving that scraping texture in the photograph. These are the striations. They're clearly oblique. But let's try and measure the pitch. So let's imagine there's the strike orientation here, running north-south horizontally across the screen. And here is the angle of the striations measured relative to that strike. So that's the pitch and the angle between the strike bar and the striations. And it's 27 measured from the north direction of our strike bar. So the pitch, 27 north. So now we've got some language that we can use to describe faults. We've seen the basic fault types and we've got a way of measuring the orientation of mechanical abrasions on fault planes that will allow us to analyse faults in more detail.